Hello, hello, hello. This is Dr. Pete Mandick from William Patterson University, and welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. This is Lecture 3. We're going to be continuing to give an overview of the rest of the course with a little bit more depth than we did in the very first lecture. In the second lecture, we looked at three big topics. In this third lecture, we're going to look at three more big topics. Again, our focus is to give just kind of a, a flavor of the things to come in the rest of the course. The three topics on focus for today is God, freedom, and the mind. Or instead of God, freedom, and the mind, we might say God, free will, and the mind. In the previous lecture, lecture two, we talked a lot about this definition of philosophy from lecture one and focusing on the topics of philosophy that are the three branches of philosophy, the three branches being metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Metaphysics has to do with reality, epistemology has to do with knowledge, and ethics has to do with value and morality. And we talked a bit about some of the main arguments that are associated with, with each of those three big topics. And we're going to do a similar thing for today. We're going to look at three more big topics and in each example give an argument or two that are um, representative of some of the, the biggest or, or most historically significant sorts of arguments that have come up in connection with these topics. And this illustrates an emphasis that you'll see throughout the course on the importance of arguments in trying to understand philosophical ideas. We're going to look at the philosophical discussion about God, which is supposed to be separate from a religious discussion of God, and we're going to look at one argument in particular in connection with the question of the existence of God. Then we're going to move and take a look at the debate over whether there's any free will and take a look at an argument against the existence of free will. And then finally, we'll talk about the mind as it concerns philosophers. And one of the main ideas in connection with the mind that gets discussed in philosophy is something known as the mind-body problem. The problem of understanding what the relationship is between your mind, which is mental, and physical things, physical bodies, like your body, specifically your brain. What's the relationship between your mind and your brain? You might think that your mind and your brain are just the same thing. Those are two different words, mind and brain, that refer to one and the same thing, a thing that thinks, the thing in virtue of which you're able to perceive and remember and learn. But perhaps they're actually two different things. Anyway, we'll get to that later. But let's jump in and talk about God. Now, you might be familiar with some important terminology in connection with discussions of God. Like, for example, terminology, theism, atheism, and even agnosticism. And let's talk a little bit about what these isms mean. And we could start right in the middle. You may have heard of atheists and atheism. And one way of thinking about what atheism is all about is it's the belief that God does not exist. Atheism is the opposite of theism, which is the belief that God does exist. Now, a lot of people reject both of these. They say, well, I don't believe that God exists, but I also don't believe that God does not exist. How can you reject both of those things? What could possibly be, for example, in the middle? And one thing that you might say is that you just, you know, you reserve judgment. You don't believe one way or the other. Maybe you acknowledge it has to be one way or the other, but you just don't know. You can't know whether God exists or not, so you reserve judgment. So agnosticism is different from atheism. Atheism says God does not exist. Agnosticism says maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but I don't know. And the agnostic might even go further and to say, not only do I not know whether God exists, but no one knows, and no one can know whether God exists. So a really strong form of agnosticism would be to hold that both the theist and the atheist are making a very big mistake, that they are making a big leap in asserting either uh, 
that God exists or that God does not exist. Both of those assertions are regarded as making a leap of faith. And the agnostic wants to stick to what they can know, and they think they can't know whether God exists. So we're going to be talking more about these throughout the, the semester, especially when we get to our God unit. What I want to focus on today is um, some arguments for theism, arguments that have been given that are alleged to prove that God exists. Now, <clears throat> some people might hold as a matter of religious faith that God exists, and that is certainly their right, and nothing that I intend to say in this course should be taken as against having a faith in the existence of God. But we want to examine a separate question, and that is, what sorts of reasons might you have for believing in God? Could you give some kind of argument that brings you to God without faith? Instead of making a leap of faith, can you get there by reasoning? And people of faith might say, well, they don't care. They're just going to rely on faith. Um, but nonetheless, it is interesting to see what you can or can't do with reason. A lot of our discussions in the unit um, about God are going to be focusing on various arguments that have been given for the existence of God, or in other words, arguments for theism. And today we're just going to focus on this one right here in the middle of this list of five arguments, an argument known as the cosmological argument, and sometimes it's called the first cause argument. And just by looking at this name, the first cause argument, you can kind of see where this is going. This is very much connected with the idea of God as being the creator of the universe, the thing from which everything else comes. Now, how could we possibly prove that God exists based on that kind of reasoning? That's the question we're going to look at when we examine the first cause argument. And one way to start thinking about the first cause argument is to just think about causation in general, to think generally about things that have causes and what it means for there to be a relationship between two things or two events that we would describe as being the relationship of cause and effect. So here's a question to think about. Would you agree with this? Would you agree that everything is caused by some other thing? You might be able to think of examples of things that are caused by other things, but the question is whether everything is like that. Let's start with some of the examples, though. So here are some things that are caused by other things. So we are familiar with the idea that a tree, like, for example, an oak tree, comes from an acorn. And this is something that's true of plants generally, that a plant grows from a seed. So you might say the, the plant is caused, and what is caused by is the seed. Or you might say it's something a little bit more complex, like the plant is caused by the seed, and the seed has to be put into soil, and the soil has to be watered, and there has to be sunlight, and there has to be carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and those things together cause the oak tree. Nonetheless, the oak tree doesn't cause itself. There's something else that causes the oak tree. It's the acorn and many other things besides. So there's one example in which at least something is caused by something else. Another example of something being caused by something else is birth, the birth of humans, also the birth of animals. So we know where babies come from. They come from their biological parents. And we know where their parents came from. They came from their parents and so on and so forth. So there's another example of one thing coming from something else. There's lots and lots of other examples, too. We know that smoke comes from fire. We know what fire comes from. Fire is caused by the appropriate combination of a fuel in the presence of oxygen and a heat source that triggers it. So that's true of at least uh, three things. we got the oak tree and the baby and the smoke and some other things besides. But is it true that everything is like that? That every single thing is caused by some other thing? Well, let's think about that. If that's true, that everything is caused by some other thing, then that seems to lead to a dilemma. A dilemma is an either-or statement. And further, when we call something a dilemma, often what we mean is that it is uh, somehow a bad dilemma, that you've got either A or B, and 
Each one of those, A and B, are bad. So this proposition that everything is caused by some other thing leads to the following dilemma. Either there's an infinite chain of earlier causes, or there's a circle of causes. So let's talk about what that means in each case. What does it mean for there to be a circle of causes? What does it mean for there to be an infinite chain of causes? And why would each of those things follow from the proposition that everything is caused by some other thing? Well, let's start with the circle. So suppose we had three things, A, B, and C. Um, so A is caused by B, B is caused by C, and C is caused by A. So in that case, we've got three things, each of which is caused by some other thing. So A is caused by B, B is caused by C, and C is caused by A. So that would be a system in which it's true that everything is caused by some other thing. But you might think that there's something really weird about this. It's really weird to think that you could have A be caused by B, which is caused by C, which is in turn caused by A. That just seems really strange. This is what's known as a causal loop. One thing that's strange about a causal loop is we tend to think of causes and effects as being related in time. So that if A is caused by B, then B must come earlier in time than A. If B is caused by C, well, C must be earlier still. So C couldn't possibly be caused by A because C is too early in time to be caused by A. The only way this would make any sense is if time travel was occurring. We're going to have an opportunity to talk more about time travel when we get to a later lecture in this course. But right now you might say, this is just really weird. It might even be weird to the point of absurdity. It's absurd to think that there could be circles of causation like this. So what's the other option? What's the other option if we're going to affirm that everything is caused by some other thing? Well, instead of having the causation be in a circle, you might try to make the causation be in a, a, a line. And further, it's going to be true in this line that everything that is caused is caused by some earlier thing. Well, um, A is going to be caused by B, B is going to be caused by C, C is going to be caused by D, and each of these things are going to be earlier. We're going to be going earlier back in time. Is there going to be an earliest thing? Well, if there is an earliest thing, then it must not have been caused. So there can't have been an earliest thing. There always has to be some other thing earlier than it that caused it if we are saying that everything is caused by some other thing. So this is the idea of an infinite chain of causation. But that's a little weird that there would be an infinite chain of causation. And why is that weird? Well, you might say that an infinite chain of causation requires that the past be infinitely deep. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the past being infinitely deep? Well, one sort of argument that some philosophers have given is an argument that says that if the past is infinitely deep, then that leads to the following absurdity. So if the past is infinitely deep, you've got to ask yourself, how long did it take for the present to occur? If the past is infinitely deep, then it would take an infinite amount of time to get to the present. But anything that takes an infinite amount of time is the same as something that never is completed. So say, for example, I painted the wall of, in my room and it took the paint an infinite amount of time to dry. If it takes an infinite amount of time to dry, that's the same as saying the paint never dries. So similarly, if there's an infinite amount of time in the past leading up to the present moment, then we would never arrive at the present moment. So the idea then of an infinite amount of time is absurd and that's supposed to make an absurdity in there being an infinite causal chain. So you might say that this dilemma is an unacceptable dilemma. If everything is caused by some other thing, then either there's an infinite causal chain of earlier causes, but that seems to lead to an absurdity, or there's a circle of causes, which also leads to an absurdity. So how do we avoid these absurdities? We just reject this initial statement that everything is caused by some other thing. Well, where does that lead us then? If it's not true that everything is caused by some other thing, even though some things are caused by earlier things, then we have to affirm then that there's at least one thing which isn't caused by some earlier thing. And this is something that we would call a first cause. So um, 
we could think of this first event as itself uncaused. It causes the next thing, which causes something else, and it ca those cause other things. But if we go back and back and back in time, we get to something called the first cause. This is the uncaused cause. Sometimes it gets referred to as the unmoved mover. And then we conclude that thing, the first cause, is God. So therefore, God exists. Putting it all together, this is what the first cause argument looks like. So premise one, at least some things are caused by other things. That's the stuff about like the acorn and babies. Premise two, there can be neither a circle of causes nor an infinite chain of earlier causes. Three, there must then be a first cause, and then we get our final ultimate conclusion, therefore God exists. Are there any objections that you can think of to the first cause argument? Is there anything that you think might be wrong with this argument? You might say, it seems like a pretty good argument, at least when you get up to the, the third step, that, yeah, okay, right, if, uh, if everything is caused by something else, that would seem to lead to absurdities, so there must then be a first cause. But then you might wonder about moving from this third step to this final step. Therefore, God exists. Maybe there's a problem there. One way of thinking about what the problem is is to wonder, why does the first cause have to be God? Why couldn't the first cause be the devil? So what if someone gave this argument? They said, uh, all the same things as in the previous argument, but they just changed this last part. Instead of sticking God in there, you stick the words the devil in there. It would have the same premises. Why does the first cause have to be God? Why couldn't it be the devil? There doesn't seem to be anything in these premises that would force you to conclude that the first cause is good, the way God's supposed to be good, as opposed to evil, the way the devil is supposed to be evil. And that's another way of saying that there's just not enough information in these initial premises to lead to the conclusion. And another way of putting that is to say that the argument is invalid. The premises don't logically necessitate the conclusion. So, at least tentatively, we might say it's not a very good argument. So that's just an overview of one aspect of the discussion of God. There's a lot more that we could say about these things, but this is just to give a bit of an introduction right now. Let's move on to the next uh, big topic, which is the topic of free will. Free will in philosophical discussions is often discussed in connection with an idea known as determinism or predestination. This is closely related to what we were just talking about in connection with God, and that is ideas about cause and effect, the idea of things being caused by other things. And when you start thinking about cause and effect in connection with free will, you might be led to the thought that maybe there isn't any free will. And the idea goes something like this. What we are, human beings, we are just parts of nature. We are as much governed by the laws of nature as uh, an object that you might let go. If you were to hold a ball or something like that, or look, I've got a little rubber brain. If I let go of this rubber brain, gravity is going to make it fall. That's just part of the laws of nature. And similarly, you and your body are fully determined, fully governed by the laws of nature. And the things that are happening in your body right now are the effect of things that were happening way before you were even born. There's a sense then in which the, everything that you do isn't really up to you. It is the effect of forces that have been underway for literally billions of years. So this leads to a kind of view that you don't really have free will. Instead, you're kind of a puppet or a marionette. Why are you a puppet or a marionette? Well, everything that you do is caused by what your brain does, and your brain is doing things that are caused by the rest of the universe. This general line of thinking is something that we could put in the form of an argument, and we could label that argument the regress of reasons argument against free will. This is a little bit more complicated than the argument about God that we were just discussing, 
the argument about God that we were just discussing had only uh, like three premises in it. But this argument is going to be a little bit more complex. We've got a representation of it here as having six premises. Um, we could read through them real quick right now and then take some time to, to meditate on some of the main parts a little bit later. So let's look at the way this argument is supposed to go. It's supposed to be fleshing out the basic idea that I laid out here about how your actions are the, the result of what your brain does and your brain is just doing things that are caused by earlier things in the universe. So we can put it like this. So here's our first premise. You always act according to your greatest desire and second premise, your desires and their relative strengths are outside of your control. These are two of the most important premises in the whole argument. And once you get your head wrapped around those two, the rest of the argument flows pretty rapidly. So like a lot of the arguments that we'll discuss in this class, this argument has sub conclusions. So you've got premise one and two, and they're supposed to prove the third premise, which goes on and gets used as a premise later for the rest of the argument. So from one and two, it's supposed to follow that your actions are outside of your control. And then we've got an additional premise. If your actions are outside of your control, then they are not a result of your choices. And then we've got this fifth premise, which here is another sub conclusion. This fifth premise is supposed to follow from premises three and four. This fifth premise says, your actions are not the result of your choices. And then on line six here, it says, if your actions are not the result of your choices, then you have no free will. And now we're pretty darn close to the very ultimate conclusion of this argument, and that is that you have no free will. So, like I said, these first two premises are where I'll, probably most of the logical action is at in the argument. And it's worth thinking a little bit more about what these premises mean and why these premises are supposed to be true. So let's start with the very first premise that says you always act according to your greatest desire. And let's think about whether that makes sense to us. Is that true that you always act according to your greatest desire? Well, let's take an example. So here is Sally. She's all grown up. She's done playing with her marble and uh, it's lunchtime and Sally is wondering what she's going to have for lunch. And she goes to the, the restaurant and they have two choices. She could either eat a piece of pizza or this giant banana. And now, what is she going to eat? Well, she asks herself, what do I want? What am I going to eat? Isn't it obvious that whatever she eats is going to be what she most desires? Or maybe a better way to put it is that whatever she does is going to be determined by what her greatest desire is. And you might say, well, I'm not sure this is correct. What if Sally is really, really in love with pizza? And that's what she wants most. But she is a, um, an amateur wrestler and she's trying to lose some weight for the big wrestling match. And even though she really loves pizza and would much rather eat a piece of pizza, she eats a banana anyway. So doesn't that prove that she doesn't act on her greatest desire? Isn't her greatest desire to eat pizza, but she eats the banana? Well, maybe that's missing the point here. Maybe what we should focus on is to ask, why does she act the way that she does? So if she eats the banana, even though she likes pizza better, why is she eating the banana? Well, she's eating the banana because of the de desires that she has besides the desire for pizza. Yes, she desires to eat pizza, but she also desires to lose weight so she can win the wrestling match this weekend. So what is her greatest desire then? Is her greatest desire the, the desire to taste pizza? No, even though she really, really wants to taste the pizza, she has a greater desire, and that is the desire to lose weight in time for the wrestling match. So therefore she eats the banana. So even though she doesn't like the taste of the banana as much as she likes the taste of the pizza, she does desire to, to eat the banana. Because what she really desires is to lose weight, and the banana is the, the less fattening choice in this particular situation. So if we think through this example of Sally and the pizza and the banana, it still seems to make sense that you always act according to your greatest desire. 
Otherwise, your action is just irrational. If I just jumped out the window right now, even though I didn't want to jump out the window, even though that's not what my greatest desire was, my greatest desire was actually to sit here and make this philosophy video. I really like philosophy. But uh, if I did that, if I did something that wasn't my greatest desire, you might say that was irrational. And you might even say that's not really acting. That is just like some weird... Um, Reflex, it isn't an action. So whenever I act, you might say, it's got to be a rational action. It's got to be an action for reasons. And what my reasons are, are my greatest desires. Here's another important part of the argument. Your desires and their relative strengths are outside of your control. Now, if you're wondering whether that's true or not, you might wonder, well... What's the opposite of this? What makes more sense to say that your desires and the relative strengths are outside of your control? Or instead to say that they are in your control? Well, let's think a little bit about what it would mean for something to be in your control. If it's in my control, whether this guitar gets played or not, that means I could choose to play the guitar. But if I could choose to play my guitar then I would have to have some kind of desire to play my guitar, right? Um, so if I could choose what my desires and their relative strengths are going to be, in order to do that, I would have to have some desire for what those desires are going to be. Okay, hi. All right. Welcome back. There's been a slight hiccup, and we're going to just pick up right here with the discussion of premise two, the idea that your desires and their relative strengths are outside of your control. And why is that supposed to be true? Well, consider the opposite. Consider the proposition that your desires and their relative strengths are inside of your control. You could decide what you're going to desire, but if you're going to decide to do something, you have to have a desire for that. So if you desire what you're going to desire, that seems to presuppose some prior desire. And that seems absurd. That seems like it's as absurd as the proposition that there could be a sculpture that can make itself, a sculpture that could carve itself. So you put these two premises together, and they seem to lead pretty nicely to this conclusion that there isn't any free will. If you act always according to your greatest desire, and your greatest desire and the relative, uh, the, your desires and their relative strengths are outside of your control, then it seems like whatever you do isn't something that resulted from your choosing to do it, and therefore it wasn't something that was happening according to, or as a part of, your free will. Okay, so that's just a brief introduction to free will, especially a, a very um, strong argument concerning whether we have free will. Let's take a little look at the topic of the mind as it is of interest to philosophy. So when we think about the mind, one way of being very simplistic about it is to say that the mind is really uh, a collection of mental states, and there's two kinds of mental states, what we might call thoughts and experiences. Thoughts include things like beliefs and, and doubts and intentions. And then there's another kind of mental state that we can call experiences, and this would include emotions, like an experience of anger or happiness, and also sensations, like the sensation of feeling cold or a visual sensation, the sensation of seeing the color blue. And for our discussion right now, in this video, we're going to focus on sensations, like for example, the sensation of tasting orange juice right after you have brushed your teeth. Many of you might have had that experience and appreciate that Orange juice tastes a lot better before you brush your teeth. If you taste some orange juice right after you brush your teeth, the orange juice is going to taste different. And this example illustrates the way in which sensations, like the sensation, the taste, the taste sensation, are subjective. The objective facts in the matter about orange juice are that it's got a certain amount of acid in it. It's got citric acid in it, and it's got sugar in it, and... It has the same amount of sugar and citric acid in it, regardless of whether you have brushed your teeth or not. 
So the objective status of the orange juice doesn't change, but the way it tastes does change. And so that is something that is subjective. The way that it tastes has to do with the sensations that you're having. Other kinds of sensations include sensations that go along with vision. And one way to appreciate the subjectivity of visual sensations is if you were to cover one of your eyes for a while and uh, you know count to 20, count to 30, and then after a while you uncover your eye and you look out of one eye versus the other and pay attention to the way in which things look different to the two different eyes. You might say that when you look out of one eye versus the other things look slightly darker or slightly bluer. Now the objective world that you're looking at isn't changing, but there's a subjective difference between looking at one eye versus the other, and that subjective difference is the sensation. It's the mental aspect of your visual perceptions. Another illustration of the subjectivity of sensation can be generated with after images. So if you were to stare at one of these little black dots, like this black dot here, or this black dot here for a while, like let's focus on this one here. So this black dot on the upper left, if you stare at that for a while, and then move your direction of where you're looking and look down here, you might see some colored after images. And a lot of people would, would I think, agree that the color of the after images, like if you stare at this grouping and then you move the after images to be down here, the colors that you see down here are going to be similar to the colors that you see up here and vice versa. So if you were to stare at the upper right hand dot for a while and then look down here, the colors that you see down here are going to be similar to the colors that are up here or not. But anyway, the point of after images is to generate a visual experience, a visual sensation in the absence of its corresponding stimulus. So you might see something down here that seems reddish, even though you appreciate in some sense that in an objective reality there's nothing red there. That after image is somehow inside of you and is therefore subjective. One of the big debates that we're going to examine in connection with the mind is the debate between physicalism and dualism. If we're focusing on sensations, we could put the proposition of physicalism as the proposition that sensations are brain processes. So when you have a red sensation or if you have a taste sensation of the orange juice tasting very sour after you brush your teeth, this is something that literally is something happening in your brain. The orange juice is not in your brain, but it's the flavor that you experience when you taste it that's in your brain. The colors that you see are ultimately in your brain. They're literally a brain process. These ideas of redness or this idea of sourness is a brain process. That's the proposition of physicalism, that sensations just are brain processes. The sensation of pain that you feel when you hurt your hand, it, it isn't in your hand. It feels like it's in your hand, but it's actually in your brain. And there's such a thing known as phantom limb phenomenon in which someone has lost their hand, their hand has gotten amputated, but they nonetheless have, feel pains in that missing hand. It feels like they have a pain in their hand, even though the hand doesn't actually exist anymore. This is an example of an experience being in your brain, even though it doesn't feel like it's in your brain, it feels like it's in your hand. Now dualism is the proposition, to put it in a very simplistic sort of way, that all of these mental things are actually happening outside of your brain. They're happening in your soul, and in ex very extreme cases, maybe your soul can leave your body. Your soul can go to heaven or go to hell or go possess somebody else or be reincarnated as a squirrel. Um, more sophisticated versions of dualism would say that the um, sensations are associated with the brain. They can't exist independently of the brain. Nonetheless, they are distinct from the brain. So the main idea here is to think of dualism as a denial of physicalism, where, some, where physicalism is saying that sensations are brain processes. Dualism is saying that sensations are not brain processes. One way of illustrating dualism is to imagine a situation in which there are two people that are very, very similar, including having very, very similar brains. We might even say they're identical. The only difference is this one's over here and this one's over here. And even though they have the same brains, when they look at strawberries, 
the sensations, the visual sensations that this guy has is the exact opposite of the visual sensations that this guy has. We might say that he has an inner sensation of greenness when he looks at strawberries or he has an inner sensation of redness. If dualism is true, that sort of thing would be possible. If physicalism is true, it would seem to follow that if they have the same brains, then they're going to have the same experiences in this situation, which gets referred to as the spectrum inversion situation, is ruled out according to physicalism. But dualism would allow for it. Let's consider an argument about this stuff, and this is a pretty famous argument in the philosophy of mind. It's an argument known as the knowledge argument, and the knowledge argument usually gets illustrated in terms of a thought experiment, and this thought experiment is a kind of hypothetical or imaginary scenario. In this thought experiment, we're going to imagine a character known as Mary. Mary is a futuristic super scientist, and her scientific specialty is brains, and she especially knows lots of things about the way brains process color information. And one of the weird things about this thought experiment is that we're supposed to imagine that Mary has spent her whole life seeing only black and white. We might imagine that she's been restricted to a black and white room where everything in the room is black and white, and that her clothes and even her skin and hair have been dyed, painted, so that they are all black and white too. So she's only ever seen things in black and white. She's only ever seen black and white TV shows. She's only ever read books and looked at pictures that were in black and white. Nonetheless, being a super scientist, she's been able to study the way the brain works. And she's read all about the brain in her black and white books and has seen all sorts of movies about the brain, about the scientific workings of the brain. So she knows everything that happens inside the brain when red light goes into a human being's eye and stimulates the relevant portions of the brain. But she spent her whole life trapped in this black and white room, and she's never seen red before. So even though she knows everything physical, she knows all the physical facts about red light, light of certain wavelengths bouncing off of strawberries and going into people's eyes, she's never seen red before. So she's never had a red sensation. And we might say, if she's never had the red sensation before, we might wonder if she knows what it's like to have a red sensation. Well, let's imagine that after a while, we finally let her have a red sensation. So we bring a big giant strawberry into her black and white laboratory, and she finally gets to see red for the first time. Question, is she going to learn something new? Is she going to now know for the first time what it's like to see red? A lot of people say it's obvious that she will learn something new, that this is something that she could not have known ahead of time. Even though she knew all of the physical facts, she couldn't have known ahead of time what it would be like to see red. But this seems to prove dualism, or at least seems to rule out physicalism. Since Mary has never experienced red before, Mary cannot know what it's like to have a red experience. But Mary already knew everything physical, so therefore red sensations must really be non-physical. And so this line of thought is supposed to favor dualism over physicalism. We could see it, this knowledge argument is being primarily an argument against physicalism. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Let's take some time to examine some, uh, some study questions. Okay, so study question one. The conclusion of the cosmological argument is A, God is self-caused, B, everything is caused by some prior, uh, something prior in the causal chain. C, there is a first cause. D, God exists. E, God does not exist. Study question two. The conclusion of the regress of reasons argument is A, you always act according to your greatest desire. B, your desires and their relative strength are outside of your control. C, if your actions are outside of your control, then they are not the result of your choices. D, you have free will. E, you have no free will. Study question three. True or false, the dualist is more likely than the physicalist to agree that if Mary knows all of the physical facts about brains, then Mary knows what it's like to see red, even if she never saw red. A is true, B is false. Okay, so we have done an overview of three arguments in connection with these three topics, God, free will, 
and the mind. And in connection with the topic of God, we talked about the cosmological argument, also known as the first cause argument. We talked about the regressive reasons argument against free will. And we talked about the knowledge argument in connection with the debate between physicalism and dualism about the mind. We focus on these arguments because that's probably the best way to understand philosophical ideas. And remember from the very first video, I talked about four strategies for success, and one of them was to emphasize the importance of arguments. Okay, so we're almost towards the end here. Here are the answers to the study questions. For number one, the answer was D. For number two, the answer was E. And for number three, the answer was B. And that brings us to the end of lecture three. I will see you next time for lecture four. All right, bye-bye.